Great. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our 2023 Permafrost Net AGM. My name is Emma Street, and this is Bernard Rabbits, and we are this year's AGM co-chairs. As we begin our meeting today, we'd like to acknowledge the Lekwungen people, also known as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, past, present, and future, who on whose traditional territory our conference is held. We start with the land acknowledgement today to honor local protocol and express gratitude to the Indigenous communities who continue to steward and live on this land. This allows us the opportunity to appreciate our roles in decolonial efforts throughout our research, teaching, learning, and unlearning. We would like to share that there is a self-guided tour offered in the Inner Harbour called Signs of Lekwungen. It is a series of seven sculptures and culturally significant places to the Lekwungen peoples. We'd encourage folks to visit this interpretive walkway to learn more about the art, history, and culture of the Coast Salish people who have resided on this land since time immemorial. <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, most know the network, but some are new. And so for those, uh, I want to quickly restate what the network is about. Uh, so we are a collaborative partnership for climate change adaptation. We are a Canadian network of universities, government agencies, industry, and indigenous communities who share a common goal, and their goal is to boost Canada's ability to monitor, predict, and adapt to large-scale permafrost thaw and its consequences. So permafrost analyze more than a third of the entire uh, uh, Canadian land uh, area, and uh, thawing permafrost um, directly impacts the lives of the people who live there. Um, they threaten the, it, it, it's threatening the safety, the re reliability, and the costs um, of infrastructure while decreasing the, the quality of the life in these uh, northern regions. So transformative change can occur if we can improve our understanding of permafrost saw and the associated risks. Um, we can find novel methods for observing and predicting this permafrost saw, um, equipping the experts with new skills and experiences and a transformed uh, Canadian permafrost com community. So our network aims to understand <clears throat> the interaction between climate, permafrost, and infrastructure in particular by uh, involving knowledge holders across complementary uh, domains while also connecting the small scale so from the findings at field sites to the large national scale predictions. So NSERC uh, Permafrost Net offers the critical mass and the diversity of expertise and the communications that no one single research group or, or government agency has. Today's agenda includes a theme update this morning Lunch is at noon, and we'll recommence at 1.30 this afternoon. We'll discuss community needs and partner needs this afternoon, and we'll finish our day with a poster session at 4 p.m., which is a really great opportunity to learn about the latest research from our next generation of permafrost scientists. So I, I just have a few more sort of the more profane, the housekeeping notes, uh, but they're quite important. Um, Starting with the washrooms, the washrooms are just uh, located across the area where you got your badges, like the reception desk. Um, if there is any emergency, then please exit through the nearest fire exit that, that is clearly marked. Um, please refrain from talking during the presentations and put your cell phones on a vibration silence mode. Um, if you need to leave the room, don't slam the doors and uh, uh, please do so quietly. <clears throat> um, please turn off your, your microphone uh, when you're not speaking, obviously. Nobody wants to be caught on a hot mic. Um, 
So we will be recording and streaming the morning presentations. So not all the stream, but the important stuff is. And we also take some photos during the event. Thank you everyone for making your way to Victoria for this event. And thank you to Tristan and all of the volunteers who have made this event possible. We hope that everyone has a wonderful three days here. And with that, we'd like to invite Alexandre Chiasson, a PhD student from the University of Alberta and Theme One to begin us off this morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Alexandre I'm a PhD student with Dwayne Fraze. And I'm happy to chair the first uh, session uh, on Team One project. And also, MI Street is going to do a talk about our project. She's from um, she's from Team Team Two. So the first speaker today is uh, Teddy Herring. She uh, did a PhD at Calgary, and after that, she did a postdoc with Dr. Tony Leskovich at U of A, and now she is uh, another uh, a postdoc with Jocelyn Haley working on geophysics. So uh, welcome, Teddy. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Thank you to the organizers for setting up the 2023 PermafrostNet AGM. I am a PermafrostNet alumni. I finished my postdoc uh, earlier this year, and that was with Tony Lovkovich at the University of Ottawa. So today, I'll be sharing some of the key outcomes of my project, which was the Canadian Permafrost Electrical Resistivity Survey CPERS uh, database project. So because I'll be talking about these electrical resistivity tomography or ERT surveys a bit, I always like to start off with a slide of what are they and why, why they're useful. So this is a geophysical method where we place metal electrodes in the ground surface. We collect a bunch of electrical resistance measurements and with some processing, we get a nice image that looks something like this where this is a cross-section of the Earth's electrical resistivity. And in permafrost environments, we can make some interpretations about what parts of the ground are frozen and which parts are not, because frozen material tends to be much more resistive. So here we could say the blue highly resistive zones are probably frozen, and then the red ones are probably unfrozen. So this is a really co valuable complement to things like borehole temperatures. And why do we need a database? Well, this is the uh, typical data storage setup for many individual researchers. So this is data that's been collected in the field that's now stored on somebody's old field laptop, on a USB thumb drive somewhere, uh, in old field notebooks. And while people do often publish their results in a paper, it's very rare for people to actually publish their raw data. So. The motivation for this project was to create a database where we could store these data in a centralized location, in a standardized format, and really just make it accessible to other people who want to use this data. So <clears throat> I created and populated a database, and currently we have 209 ERT profiles in this database uh, with 280 surveys. So meaning that some of these have been repeated, are, are time-lapse measurements, and located in various parts of North America. Data were collected between 2008 and 2022. And there are currently 16 unique landform types represented in the database. So I should note that when people are submitting data to the database, they fill out a metadata form where there is standardized language to describe like the landform, the vegetation, um, any disturbance, things like that. I also built an interactive web map. So this, you can actually access this if you go to the PermafrostNet website and under data, there is a link to the CEPERS webpage, which includes this interactive map of surveys. So you can, it might be hard to see, but you can search the database by different parameters, like if you want to find data collected in a specific date range or in a specific place or of a specific landform, et cetera, you can easily search. And if you hover over any of these points, you can see some metadata associated with that profile. And then when you cl click on it, it will plot the survey results. 
So making it really easy to search and visualize data. I also uh, put together a Nordic Hannity data publication with the intention of archiving this data long term in an established repository so it doesn't, you know, kind of vanish after the end of permafrostnet. So all the raw data, all the metadata are available in this data publication that has a DOI, it's citable, and it'll be there forever. Some other useful outputs of this project. Uh, one of them, I developed an open source data processing workflow. So this is a repository where there's just code to process the data. And the reason this is nice is because the software that most people are using for this is proprietary, it's expensive, and it's a bit of a black box. So it's a little unclear sometimes what's going on in the guts. So having this as a resource will hopefully be helpful for people. This is uh, something that I'm really proud of and really excited about. We very recently published a paper in permafrost and periglacial processes describing guidelines for best practices for doing ERT surveys of permafrost. So this was a collaborative effort with basically all the hotshots in my field, all the people I really look up to who are pros at ERT permafrost stuff. So in this paper, I reviewed more than 300 literature publications that used ERT to study permafrost and looked to see what people were doing. And based on that and the expert opinions of the co-authors that I was working with, we developed some guidelines for best practices. So I'm hoping this will be a useful document for people who are looking to do these types of geophysical surveys, um, really just to get the best value for your time and make sure you're doing everything you can be doing in the field to get the data that you need. Uh, this is also open access published in PPP, so I invite you to look it up if you like. And as part of that review paper, I compiled all the data, all the um, publications that I cited there. So there's a searchable interactive table of the 302 publications that I looked through, and you can search by different parameters, so you could look up if you want. 3D surveys, or if you want surveys done in Russia, or if you want papers done in 2022 or later. So you can search this table really easily, and hopefully that will be a useful resource as well. I started to make some large-scale interpretations of permafrost conditions. And this was kind of a first pass of this, but what I did here was I took the average resistivity under each of these published surveys, um, and plotted it against mean annual air temperature. So this is kind of neat because we can see that at colder environments, we tend to have more resistive ground, which makes sense. Permafrost tends to be more uh, widespread, colder, more resistive. So there's an overall trend of increasing resistivity with colder temperature, but there's also a ton of spread ag around this line of best fit. So it's been really interesting to go through the metadata fields and see how site conditions are affecting subsurface resistivity. So for example, this was looking at a few different landforms. So I cherry picked a couple here admittedly, but uh, some ice rich landforms like lithalsas, which are shown in pink and pulses shown in blue, those tend to have higher resistivity. Whereas other landforms like thermokarst mounds that are associated with thaw processes have lower resistivities. So this is kind of indicating the influence of what the landform, uh, how that relates to the subsurface resistivity. This one was also super cool. So I looked at the disturbance class and how that affected subsurface resistivity. So this is showing in blue sites with no external disturbance um, and those tend to be fairly resistive. Whereas sites with widespread anthropogenic surface disturbance show, uh, which are shown in red here, show noticeably lower electrical resistivities. So it's kind of interesting to see that potentially the surface disturbance is uh, lowering the resistivity, potentially indicating um, permafrost warming and thaw. So I think it's pretty interesting. And then thinking about what happens next, um, I'd like to hopefully add new data to the database in annual updates. I'd like to try some better large scale interpretations. I just showed an initial pass here, but it would be really cool to, well, 
A, have more data, and B, try more advanced techniques to analyze that information and draw some correlations. So maybe something like machine learning would be applicable here. And then really just improve how data is shared and used in the permafrost community. So here's a picture where we were doing some field work in the Yukon and stopped at the Yukon Geological Survey. And Moira there was interested in work Tony had done in Mayo many years before. And um, so it was really nice that we were able to pull up the website and Tony could easily like show the location, show the survey results of some work that he'd done in Mayo many, many years ago. And with that, uh, that's the end of my presentation. And I would like to thank, I mean, this, there were so many people that were involved in making this a, a success, successful project. So uh, thank you to those people and organizations that made it happen. So happy to take any questions if anybody has any. Yeah, so there are lots of things that could be classified as a disturbance, but maybe um, buildings, roads, trails, things like that where um, the surface has been disturbed. So there are several disturbance classes that people could uh, identify. So it could be anthropogenic, like roads and whatnot, could be forest fires, could be things like that. So anything that would cause surface conditions to change, really. Yeah. It's going on with that disturbance idea. Um, when you looked at the resistivity of the disturbed areas, was that of the sort of an average of the entire profile? Yeah, so the points on that plot were the average resistivity of the whole profile, which is kind of painting things in broad strokes and not really getting the nuance of, you know, where is it lower resistivity, where has it been disturbed? But yes, this is an average value of the whole site. Yeah, so you, it might be interesting to take a look at that in the future. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of these disturbed places, of course, they're like putting extra dirt on the ground or gravel on the ground to insulate the permafrost. So you might have very low res resistivities in the near surface, which are sort of averaged out or counteracted mm -hmm. by the higher resistivities down below where you've preserved the permafrost. Totally. Yeah, a, a lot of researchers have looked at like a zone of interest and kind of delineated like, here's where I think the permafrost is and calculating an average resistivity in that zone. So that would be a logical next step to kind of make it a little bit more refined of what region we're actually looking at. Yeah, yeah totally. Cool. I, I'm not really familiar with a lot of this kind of data, but I'm just wondering if you're looking to get more sort of submissions on this kind of data, what do, what do you have in the way of like quality control? How are you making sure that these are properly done? Because my, my, my impression is that it could be done wrong, <laughs> just um, as an outsider. So are you just talking about data quality? Yeah. So when I'm accepting <laughs> submissions, it's just the raw measurements, and then um, those are all archived. So it's not that I'm doing anything to them. I'm just uh, saving the raw data in a repository. And like on the map of surveys that I showed, that's been processed with a automated routine that I developed that filters out poor quality data and processes everything in a standardized way. So the raw data are available if people want to try different things or look at the data themselves and assess the quality. And then as a first pass, I have the sort of initial results on this website. Great, thank you. Yeah. Just when I thought I was off the hook. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, just wondering because I mean there's other databases like uh, of boreholes and so on because mm -hmm. I'm sure that some of these studies they involved like simultaneous boreholes and so on. so is, is that all already uh, foreseen that these databases can sort of inter-query then later or is this built in into the design or? Yeah, that's I mean that's a great question and it would be really cool to be able to have all the data types integrated really nicely and stored in one place. It's tricky to do, of course. So what I've done here is I had metadata fields where people could describe the other data types that have been collected at the site. And then there's also a portion where you can fill in information about boreholes, including like if it has a GTNP code, for example. So um, at least making people aware that there are other data types collected and providing the contact information for the PI where you can reach so out to them. So there are basically suitable hooks in the design already where one could up the architecture later. Yes, if somebody was uh, 
paid to do that. It, I mean, it's such a big project to try to integrate all these data types together. I would love to see it, but it's it's a ton of work, right? Great question, though. Thank you. So I would like to invite the next speaker. Uh, her name is Zakia Mohamed Madi. Uh, she is doing a PhD with Jocelyn at Calgary, uh, yeah, University of Calgary, and she's going to present about tax consolidation result from a large uh, database. So welcome, Zakia. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I need to figure out. Good morning, everyone, uh, and uh, uh, thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Zakia Mohammadi, and I am a PhD candidate at University of Calgary. Today, I will be presenting some of the works we did on using SAW consolidation test results for estimating SAW settlement. So, uh, as part of my PhD project, I collected and homogenized. Uh, some of the existing soil, consoli soil consolidation test results uh, for permafrost samples across Canada. Uh, we used, uh, we collected these data with the objective of gaining some insights into the distinct soil consolidation behavior of three major soil categories, including fine grain, coarse grain, and peat samples. And uh, we uh, we are going to use these data for characterizing and parameterizing soil settlement behavior within these groups and uh, also to develop some tools. And we also believe that integrating these data into a database can help with uh, contributing to building more geotechnical databases for permafrost. So the data I have been uh, collecting are from two main sources. Uh, the first one is the data collected by Center, the Center for Northern Studies at Laval University. These uh, samples are mostly taken from Nunavik, Northern Quebec. And the other one is the data collected during Arctic gas pipeline project. Uh, and uh, they are mostly from uh, Mackenzie Valley in Northwest Territory and some locations in Yukon. In total, there are about 400 samples. And you, you can see the distribution of these samples within the three soil categories that I just mentioned. We looked into the variation and ranges for some of the index properties reported in this data. And we could see that uh, generally peat samples are showing substantially different range, ranges and uh, different mean values for uh, some of the index properties that you can see in the slides, including gravimetric water content, volumetric water content, initial void ratio, and frozen bulk density. When comparing fine grain and coarse grain sediments, uh, so again, we could see that the fine grains are uh, having uh, larger variation, larger ranges, and also uh, generally uh, uh, higher mean values, uh, uh, except for the frozen bulk density that these two groups had very similar uh, uh, ranges and variations. So this data also has soil consolidation test results, which is uh, uh, a test that involves sawing of a sample uh, of a permafrost sample under an initial load, uh, under an initial load, and then subjecting the sawed sample uh, to additional load. Uh, this is used for uh, measuring soil uh, volume change behavior of these samples. And right now, there is no standard procedure for, uh, for the test, uh, which makes it challenging to compare test results uh, from various sources that are done with different methods. So uh, to make the results comparable, we use some comparative parameters. And uh, these parameters are uh, taken from two different methods for uh, representing the test result. The first method is uh, plotting void ratio uh, against pressure on a log scale, and the other one is soft strain versus pressure on our arithmetic scale. Uh, from the, for both methods, we are fitting a line into the data, and uh, we are using the intercept and slope as a parameter, uh, as, a, as a comparative parameter. These uh, parameters are commonly used in the literature, and uh, they provide us uh, with, uh, and they can be used for characterizing the settlement behavior. So uh, 
looking into the test results, we could see that uh, the nonlinear representation, uh, semi-log representation, was working better for uh, characterizing the behavior of the peat samples and fine grain samples. But for coarse grain samples, the compressibility, which is uh, represented by the slope of the, of the line, was very low, and uh, the nonlinear behavior was not very pronounced. So we calculated these parameters for all the samples, and here you can see a box plot showing the uh, ranges and variation of these parameters. Again, uh, for peat samples, substantially different ranges and mean values uh, were, were observed uh, with higher mean values uh, uh, than, said, uh, than uh, the other two groups. For fine grain versus coarse grain, we could see that fine grain soils are also, are again, showing a larger range and uh, generally a higher uh, value for these parameters. Uh, except for the saw uh, settlement parameter, which is the intercept of uh, the intercept of the line when we are plotting the data in a SP um, uh, uh, with SP results, strain versus pressure results. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the key application of these data is to develop some correlation for estimating saw settlement. So we looked into the correlation coefficient between index properties and these parameters obtained from the test results. And uh, for the coarse grain samples, we so the objective was uh, was to find the uh, uh, best uh, index properties that we can use for predicting these uh, parameters. And for coarse grain samples. Uh, volumetric water content was found to be a good, uh, a better predictor, but uh, this is not something commonly reported for uh, for permafrost samples and in borehole logs. For fine grain and peat, uh, for fine grain and peat, uh, as I mentioned, S log P was a better way to represent the results, and uh, we could see that water content can be uh, gravimetric water content can be a good predictor uh, for estimating. Uh, these two parameters and, uh, and uh, developing some tools for uh, estimating settlement. So uh, for the next couple slides, I want to only focus on peat samples and how we use these data to uh, estimate settlement for this group. So here you can see the correlations developed for uh, those two parameters, we, we are calling them, calling these parameters sod void ratio and uh, compression index uh, for peat samples. So we used water content to predict this, uh, to develop these correlations. And you can see that the models show a strong fit. And uh, we also, we, so we have those parameters and we, I, we assumed an idealized uh, void ratio uh, pressure relationship. And uh, we, uh, to make the, this, uh, uh, more, to simplify the problem, we assume that the total settlement has three uh, components. Uh, the first component was uh, the, the portion caused by the uh, uh, expulsion of excess water and uh, excess ice ex after melting and gas from the soil structure uh, happening right after sawing. Uh, and the other one was the compression uh, due to the pressure, applied pressure. And the third component was time-dependent uh, uh, settlement, which is uh, important for peat samples because uh, uh, that can uh, contribute significantly to the total settlement. So, uh, so uh, we also developed some uh, design charts to be able to uh, get these, uh, the, the, to, cal to do the calculation and get the total settlement. So this uh, made the, so for settlement calculation, you, you, you only need water content, pressure, and time, which, was, which are the uh, problem condition. And uh, we also use some literature, uh, re relationships in literature to calculate the rate of the time-dependent compression uh, using the uh, primary compression, which is uh, defined by the C sub C that we already have from the correlations. And uh, another example of using this data was uh, the 
using the data for coarse grain sediments. So uh, for this group, we could see that uh, uh, unfrozen, uh, like for this group, we could see that there is a uh, different, there is a gap, there is a different uh, <laughs> substantial difference between the frozen initial void ratio and sod void ratio for these samples. And for cohesionless soils, uh, there are uh, laboratory measured minimum void ratios that can be used, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, can be used, uh, we believe that can be used to draw some conclusion about the sod void ratio for this type of soil. And uh, the literature and data on minimum void ratio suggests that it depends on particle size distribution and morphology of the sample of the particles. So we use the data on minimum void ratio and particle size distribution to come up with some, to group the, the samples that we have uh, in these, uh, for, for these data and come up with some ranges for the sod void ratio for five gradation of cohesion less sediments. Uh, to validate this sod void ratio, uh, we calculated saw strain uh, using this method and compare it with the measured saw strain. And uh, you can see, uh, I think it's a, you can see that it was a strong fit between uh, these uh, these two uh, uh, measure, these two variables, and also we compared the results uh, with some of the existing empirical correlations in the literature. And uh, we, we observed that um, our method uh, has an improved accuracy and reduced bias in estimating cell saw strain uh, for this uh, type of soils. And uh, to just uh, wrap up my presentation, uh, uh, so we have uh, unified and homogenized uh, some of the existing data and we believe that Publishing this can enhance the accessibility and applicability of that, and this is some work in progress that we are uh, that we are uh, going to do. And uh, we also think that this can contribute to permafrost to creating more permafrost uh, geotechnical databases. And uh, using these data, we could uh, see the distinct soil settlement behavior within. Uh, different soil groups, and uh, this highlights the importance of considering soil type when we are uh, estimating uh, soil settlement. And uh, we were able to develop some correlations for key parameters such as CC and uh, uh, soil void ratio, which are crucial for uh, characterizing the settlement behavior and uh, for optimizing, and subsequently for optimizing the engineering design and making more informed decisions. And we also believe that these data can provide, like the knowledge and insight into saw strain can provide uh, some insights about ground ice condition. And this is something that uh, we can, we like I'm, I'm thinking of as doing uh, as the next steps to, to be able to use the da these data for interpreting uh, ground ice condition. Yeah, thank you everyone, yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Riley Bett. It was a key. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, you're right. This is going to do so much good for, for the design that we're trying to do. Um, really kind of off kilter of the presentation, your p-values, you had the stresses ranging from like 5 to 100 kPa. Was that based on the database from the data you collected, or is that a range that you think is pretty realistic, or just wondering? Yeah. Definitely, yeah. So for peat samples, I just assumed, uh, so for those design charts, I just assumed this could be a, a reasonable range when we are talking about peat samples because they are fairly like shadow uh, settlements. And I think, uh, yeah, that, that was uh, just based on uh, coming up with some reasonable ranges for those, those type of soils, I think. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Dwayne Frace from University of Alberta, and that was a great presentation, Zakia. I was just curious about the frozen void ratios that you're reporting. Are those actually measured as frozen void, or are those estimated? And then ultimately, when you're reporting the reduced void ratios on your strain or on your settlement, are those just estimated kind of numbers? I'm 
just curious how they're measuring them. Yeah. So for this data, they are kind of measured because uh, they were doing the test. So as when uh, like when we are preparing the the sample for the test, those measurements were done uh, for the samples. And uh, also, if we have other properties reported like gravi like uh, specific gravity, water content, we will be able to calculate uh, void ratios from those uh, those data. Yeah, from was, those information. I was guessing it was probably more estimated from the settlement uh, data. Yeah, like uh, I think uh, for the because uh, this was uh, like this sample were tested in the lab. The, those are measured. Yeah, initial ones are measured, but right. for the final one, again measured because uh, when you are doing the test, you can you are uh, recording and measuring the void ratio change. Yeah, I'm just curious because you'll see the CT poster we have where we're measuring it with the CT data and seeing that consolidation afterwards. Hi, I'm John Su. I'm uh, visiting from UBC. Uh, Zakia, this was fantastic. I think it's going to open up a lot of new avenues for um, modeling work too. And I was wondering, have you compared your results to say some compaction models or um, some existing uh, physics-based relationships to see what new physics we can learn um, from this that might not be captured there? Um, so, uh, no, I haven't done that yet, uh, but uh, definitely the pressure is that when we are talking about uh, compressibility, the, the, the applied load is a very important uh, um, uh, variable. And uh, but for the test results, I think we we already have uh, the volume change behavior versus pressure. So we are mostly like focusing on consolidation and uh, consolidation rather than compaction, like in this test. But uh, that would be something interesting to look into in the future. Like because you can also get at. Um, critical length scales and uh, other parameters that could be, you know, observable in the field as well, which mm -hmm. would be cool. Yes. Yeah, thank you.